Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents. David Walker. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, January 16th, 2017. Ooh, that's tricky. 16 and a 17. And it is also, well, it depends on where you are, I guess, here in America. For the most of us, it is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I don't know why they don't have us say out the whole honorifics, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's one of the few chances we get to do that. Uh, but if you are in Biloxi, Mississippi, it turns out they're trying to get away with calling this Great Americans Day. I'm not entirely sure what the motivation of that is. Maybe it's economic anxiety. I can't really tell. But uh, it, it's it's giving them fits. I can tell you that. I guess they, they just couldn't bring themselves. Why Biloxi of all places? I don't know. I'm sure it's elsewhere as well. Uh, but I guess they just can't still at this late date bring themselves to just call it Martin Luther King Day. It can't be all about him. There's got to be other, you know, and I'm sure their the thinking was, what's wrong? We're saying he's a great American. What's the problem with that? Yeah, well, anyways, uh, that's not going over very well. Federal government office buildings are closed today, and that results in a lot of closures elsewhere. Kids are home today. The Kigger in the Morning World Headquarters, as I mentioned in the Morning Post, is full up. But that doesn't mean everybody else is actually up. We have <laughs> there, there are a few of us rattling around in the uh, headquarters at the moment. Uh, I'm sure things will get noisier as we go on. But uh, everybody's celebrating the day by, I guess, sleeping in for civil rights. Uh, that's the way it goes when you have kids at home. Uh, you're awake. That's the important thing. Or you're listening on podcast, which means you were, I don't know, you could have been asleep at the time. I don't know. This does, not everyone celebrates uniformly. Anyway... We're ready to roll, sort of, with another show, by which I mean it's about 9 o'clock and we feel uh, obligated to move forward. Daily Coast Radio is live now, as Bill mentions in his morning tweet. X, that's me, David Waldman, wishes you a happy, happy Biloxi Steps and Doo-Doo Day uh, forever after. I suppose it could be known as this. All right, what did you do with your weekend? What are you doing with your long weekend? Are you getting ready for... Oh, I don't know. Let's say the inauguration of the next whatever we're going to call this guy, Donald Trump. It's been a wild weekend with him. Let's say, oh, uh oh, he's tweeting again. I see there's something that uh, he tweeted just a few minutes ago. Andrew Kaczynski already on the case, as many thousands of Americans are uh, checking out what he's got to say in the morning. Celebrate Martin Luther King Day and all the many wonderful things that he stood for. Honor him. For being the great man that he was. Let's see, that a, twi a Twitter for Android, so the man himself may have sent that one out. Uh, he spent most of the weekend melting down over various issues, uh, including having been, I don't know, I mean, it wasn't even that he was challenged per se, but he was criticized by John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, of course, of Georgia, and he decided to spend the weekend shouting at him, Good timing, what with it being uh, Martin Luther King weekend and all. And, of course, his criticism of of uh, Lewis, particularly poorly founded. I don't really think I have to tell you the story. I think everybody picked up on this one over the weekend. But uh, I guess I was wondering, as it turns out, uh, well, his criticism of John Lewis was that he should uh, spend more time helping out Finding solutions for America's ravaged inner cities, quote unquote inner cities, who is that? that is to say where where black people live. That's how much he hates those inner cities. I mean, Donald Trump is an inner city guy, lives in Manhattan, but uh, that part is supposedly too nice to be criticized. John Lewis's district, as it turns out, is doing fairly well. One way I'd even say pretty damn well uh, for anywhere, but uh, it's a it's a pretty upscale district and a lot of thriving. Black institutions, uh, businesses, colleges, um, uh, etc., going on there, and uh, not far from some of the most gentrified places in the city. Not that it mattered at all, because the criticism was ridiculous and unfounded to begin with. But 
But you all knew that. Anyway, early intro today, uh, which is great because there's a corner of a Pop-Tart still sitting here waiting for me. Good morning, Greg. Good how morning. Doing? How are you? These days I, off I, I are tough that. for breakfast. Yes. You know, we, we can sense these things. And uh, it just it said to me, you know, you need just another moment to finish that Pop-Tart. You yeah. Need to have right. some coffee. So I thought I'd call in early. And Thank you. Your, your voice sounds great. I think you're all totally better. recovered from last week. I hope so. I still I still feel miserable, but it might be that Donald Trump is going to be president. Listen, this is Martin Luther King Day, and it's a time to honor a lot of things. And one thing I think we should honor in uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, memory and spirit is, uh, you know, some some thank yous. All right. Some some struggling for the right word. Some bridges to uh, to people, whether it's conservatives and never Trumpers who tried but failed to keep this guy out, whether it's uh, uh, people who disagreed uh, during the primaries, Bernie. Hillary, all that sort of thing. Uh, it's a day to recognize that uh, there's a lot that uh, ties us together. It isn't just all about how Donald Trump is awful. But by the way, Donald Trump is awful. And so what happens is you come into a day with a spirit like this and then uh, realize that uh, over the weekend uh, some really interesting things happened, that, that, uh, that Donald Trump decides to go after uh, a hero, an American icon like, uh, like John Lewis, yes. and people like Ben Sasse, Republican, and a few other congressional members, a few others, Republican, tweet back saying, this is really stupid. Yeah, not real that, smart. That, that, that a lot of people made a big mistake in the 20th century by going after John Lewis. Don't make that mistake in the 21st century. Right. Uh, I mean, every Martin Luther King Day is kind of weird that way, particularly when all the uh, – well, when, when white conservatives and particularly ultra-conservatives uh, who spend the rest of the year not – being particularly good friends of the civil rights movement, uh, either spend the day declaring him a secret conservative, that is to say Martin Luther King himself, or uh, remind everybody today, like for instance with Black Lives Matter, well, you know, the difference between you and the great Dr. King is that he never X, Y, Z, all the things, of course, of which they accuse Black Lives Matter now, which they, of course, when he was still alive, used to accuse Martin Luther King, despite the fact that they, uh, you know, 40-something years later recognize, eh, well, okay, uh, he wasn't any of those things, and you shouldn't be either. Right. But, yeah. A little right. 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 We, we fully understand and recognize that uh, America um, uh, venerates a uh, somewhat sanitized version of Martin Luther King, and for those who uh, really care yes. about these things, I think the best way to understand this is to actually look at his own writings. Yeah, pretty uh, well. That will be instructive. Better from Birmingham the, jail, especially the sanitized Just, you know, version, and murdered the real one. Yeah, but but read that letter and, and, and do those sort of things. Uh, I'm just going to give you some headlines here. A New York Times, Trump sets off backlash with attack on civil rights icon. That is a good headline uh, because that is correct. That does it. Uh, outrage over President-elect Donald Trump's criticism of Representative John Lewis is driven by what many blacks see as his lack of understanding of their reverence for the civil rights movement. And this is also correct. And, and it's correct because I'm going to read to you a story about playing golf with him. Oh, not me, but the guy that did it wrote it up. All right. I'll Se that. Several members of Congress said they would not attend the inauguration and would meet with activists to discuss strategies to oppose Mr. Trump's administration. Yes, this is where it started, right. So what happens is, uh, and, and uh, the full quote from John Lewis is essentially he's, he's very skeptical of the fact that uh, Russia, in fact, interfered with the American election. And the idea that it had no consequences and therefore no harm, no foul. It's golf, you know, mm -hmm. just say a mulligan and don't get so upset about it. What are you so serious about that? Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't fly because everything mattered in an incredibly close election. Comey mattered, WikiLeaks mattered to some, on the, on especially uh, who decided not to vote for Clinton because they couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, it, it mattered. Of course, it affected the election. The whole idea that it didn't affect the election. <laughs> Is is wrong. It's gaslighting. It's it's trying to send a narrative that just isn't true. Yeah. So I, I think that's why it's so important to to recognize that. And yes, there are Republicans who are defending John Lewis because yeah. Mm. <laughs> so that part's good. And and I think that that's uh, that's worth focusing on. This is a really interesting piece from Margaret Sullivan in the Washington Post. Mm, okay. uh, everything I'm talking about here is independent roundup, but really I should give it to you and I will right now on Skype so it's easier to get to. Okay. 
And I like the headline here, too. It's called, A Hellscape of Lies and Distorted Reality <laughs> Awaits Journalists Covering President Trump. Oh, okay. I actually used the word hellscape over the weekend. You were right to do so, and this uh, Not about know, that. validates it. But okay. But but this is, too. Yeah, I actually use it about Laura Ingram, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is the same thing. Yes. Only one of them got elected. Uh, but at the northeast corner of the National Archives building sits Robert Aitken's sculpture, The Future, inscribed with some famous words from Shakespeare's The Temptus. What oh. is past is prologue. If you buy that, it's possible to have a solid idea of what Donald Trump's presidency will be like for the American media and for citizens who depend upon that flawed but essential institution. If you buy Short form is hellish. My goodness. Oh, yes. Well, hellish it is. Yeah, she brings up Serge uh, Kovalevsky and how that was handled. Yeah. And she says, what can this small chapter tell us about what's to come? Well, that Trump will be what columnist Frida Gittis of the Miami Herald calls the gaslighter-in-chief. Hmm. That he will pull out all stops to make people think they should believe him, not their own eyes. And and that's going to be and has been a recurring theme with you and me. You know, um, it's a question of uh, believing what you see or seeing what you believe. And he's trying to make people to see what they believe. Yeah. The techniques uh, include saying and doing things and then denying it, blaming others for misunderstanding, disparaging their concerns as oversensitivity, political correctness, I would add, mm -hmm. claiming outrageous statements were jokes or misunderstandings and other forms of twilighting the truth. True. Alliteration. There's a, there's a new one, right? Mm -hmm. Twilighting the truth, like it. But that's just part of what experience teaches us to expect from Trump. Here's another. Trump will punish journalists for doing their jobs. And what's worse is investigative reporter James Rison wrote recently, President Obama has set the stage with his administration's use of the once forgotten espionage act to prosecute government whistleblowers and threaten journalists. The blueprint awaits. Ah. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, so I, I, there are people that were mad at Obama for that, and I think uh, appropriately so. And uh, he, he's not above criticism, and here's a good area for it. But uh, Trump's going to take it to a whole new low. Yes, very likely uh, so. All right. <laughs> what, what kind of metaphor can we use here? Hmm. Obama may have left the door unlocked, but Trump came in the house and, like, stole all your stuff, you know? Right. Not equally guilty. Another, he will relentlessly manipulate. For example, Trump's first news conference as president-elect last week featured a crowd of paid staffers who cheered his statement, every statement, creating a false picture for viewers. After all, his public image is reflected in media coverage as perhaps his highest priority, and he has assembled plenty of expert help. So we can expect Trump to lie to the media, manipulate reality, and go after those who upset the notion that adulation is his birthright. Huh. So those who say, let's wait and see, maybe it won't be as bad as you think, or stay hopeful, I'm having none of it. Journalists are in for the fight of their lives. They're going to have to be better than ever before just to do their jobs. This is Alice in Wonderland stuff. you got to run this fast just to keep up. you got to run twice as fast if you want to get ahead. They, they will need to work together. That means... Figure out how you're going to ask him questions at press conferences, dudes, okay? One at a time. No three-part questions. He's a 10-year-old. Don't make it that complicated. Mm, yeah. I'm well, yelling at them, not you, because they're not listening. Oh, right. Well, well then why, why are we saying anything? Yeah, I should write it. Okay. Uh, I did see uh, that part of the press conference. Somebody, well, he actually used it against him pretty well, I thought, and and uh, and rightly so. Actually, there was a one reporter who finally got called on, and he it wasn't a three part question; it was three totally separate questions. He just basically threw out everything he ever wished he had asked Donald Trump at one time, mm -hmm. uh, and Trump just said, "Oh, uh, anything else?" And everybody <laughs> cracked up, and the, all the questions were disarmed, and he didn't have to answer any of them. Right, and he was so cute, and he was so adorable, and look at him; he's fun. Mm -hmm. I'm oh, having none of it. Yeah, that didn't work out very well for that guy. <laughs> All right. Lessons from playing golf with Trump. Hmm. That's the headline. It's from The New Yorker by David Owen. I see. Okay. Interesting story. I would think so. Five years ago, I spent most of a day with Donald Trump at one of the many golf courses he owns in West Palm Beach. The name of Trump's courses all begin with Trump, so to keep them straight, you have to refer <laughs> to them by location. Yes. Right? So it's... Coordinates. Uh, you know, there's there's... Multiple buildings in New York City with Trump on it, so you got to be careful. Yeah. At the time, Trump wasn't even a joke presidential candidate, so there was no ominous music playing in the background, no foreshadowing, tragedy to come. I was working on an article for Golf Digest. How pleasant. And the main focus was a course of his that was about to open on the east coast of Scotland near Aberdeen. Trump owns or manages 17 courses, including two in Scotland, one in Ireland, one in the Bronx. Hmm. I'm thinking, you know, I'm a New York City kid. That's nice. I think I'm going to Scotland. 
<laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's close, but still. Yeah, it's close, but still. Most of them are highly regarded, and not only by him, they appear to be more successful as businesses and investments than many of his other businesses and investments, including casinos, especially the casinos in his so-called university. Yes. I'll agree. So golf is him, and he is golf, and this is something that he does seem to be good at. If he were only a golf interpreter, interpreter, uh, then uh, perhaps he would gain respect. Respect is something that he wants and craves and doesn't get. Uh, yeah. Right? I'll agree. The reason for this may be that golf is a subject Trump actually knows something about. He's a good player, and even without adjusting for his age, he's probably the best of the many golfers who has been a president of the United States. Okay. His, his closest rival would have been JFK, who not only looked and dressed the part, but also played quite well, despite his horrendous back problems. No other president would have had much of a chance, including Eisenhower, who was the most avid golfer ever to be president, and whom Golf Digest ranked just behind JFK. Mm-hmm. Okay, Eisenhower had a practice screen built on the White House lawn, left spike marks on the floor of the Oval Office, but he had putting issues and a bum knee. Mm-hmm. And during his second presidential campaign, there was a bumper sticker that said, Ben Hogan for president. If we're going to have a golfer, let's have a good one. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's pretty funny. Back in 2012, by the way, Ben Hogan was a very good golfer. For those of you who don't know, I do not know this from playing golf, but I do know this from, like, you know, being American alive. mystery kind of stuff. Yes. Trivial pursuits and all the stuff that sinks in that, like, is under the hood until you need to pull it out. Back in 2012, Mitt Romney promised that if elected, he would not play golf. Hmm. Unlike that exactly. slacker Obama, but George W. Bush, number six among golf playing presidents, one spot below his dad, defended Obama. Eisenhower would have defended him too. He believed presidents especially need access to forms of recreation that provide temporary sanctuary from the extraordinary pressures of the office, and golf is certainly one of those. In fact, if Trump could be persuaded to spend his entire term playing golf, we might <laughs> all be better off. That could be. Right? Pretty good essay here. I'm enjoying it. So yes. I do it for fun, Trump told me over lunch. It's become a very successful business because of the level of quality. When other clubs are empty, everybody wants to join here. And by here, I mean all my clubs. Every one of them works, works really well. Trump's main topics are money and himself, maybe his only topics. He described the club's location to me as the richest place anywhere on the planet in terms of, you know, wealth. Uh, I turn down 10 for every I buy, everyone I buy. I'll buy only if it has the potential to be the best. Uh-huh. I'm not interested in having a nine. Yes, all right. Well, that's his regular puffery. Sure, okay. Well, that's the point. What he does with golf is who he is and what he does. Ah. It's well, real. Yes. And, and what you learn on the golf course about him, unfortunately, is going to be what you learn about him. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you learn a lesson. He's going to run the country this way, and it's fine He's run the country for a the way golf course golf. and not so much for the world. Right. After lunch, Trump and I play 18 yeah, sure. holes, accompanied by a bodyguard and John Niporte, the club's head professional. Friend asked me later whether Trump wasn't in on the joke of his public persona. This is the important part here. And I said that, as far as I could tell, the Trump we were used to seeing on television was the honest to God, authentic Trump, a 10 year old boy who, for unknown reasons, had been given a real airplane and a billion dollars. In other words, a fun guy to hang around with. As Tiger Woods observed recently, after also playing golf with him, Trump hits the ball a long way for a 7 year old. Okay. He certainly outdrove me. He's also a good ball striker, terrific putter, despite employing a putting technique that the club pro said is so idiosyncratic he wouldn't dare either to change it or teach it. Hmm. At the end of the round, Trump and I posed together for a photograph in front of the signature design feature of several of his courses, an enormous man-made water pole. You've seen those at mini golf and adventure <laughs> right? right here, you can picture it. Yeah, he should have gone with a except, window. Except his is bigger. Right, and waterier. And water here. It's wetter. Right. Uh, the outdoor equivalent of the huge fake gold chandeliers and the French furniture he also has weakness for, <laughs> which isn't really French because it has scare quotes around it. So I don't know what they mean when they have scare quotes around Marine it. Marine Le Pen. Yeah. Golf publications periodically rate golf courses. Maybe when they say French, it really means North Korean. I mean, maybe it's supposed to be like a scary country. I don't know. Huh. Golf Old publications Europe. periodically rate golf courses. I mean, it should be Russian. and That's hmm. what it is. It's really, you know, czarist kind of stuff. Huh? The 100 True. best in the world, the 100 best in the country, the dozen best in each state. And Trump's relationship with such ratings is, in a word, complex. He complained to me that golf publications never rank his courses high enough because the people who do the rating hold a grudge against him. But he also said he never allows raters to play his courses because they would just get in the way of the members. 
<laughs> okay. This is Donald Trump. You have to understand this when he complains about something. I'm going to give you word salad, okay? And I'm going to say it with way more confidence than Sarah Palin, but it's still word salad. Yes. I think... We'd have a revolt with our membership, he explained, because unlike other clubs, every one of my membership lists is perfect. And when you start adding hundreds of raiders who want to play golf, nonetheless, when someone from a golf publication writes something positive after somehow having managed to slip past the perimeter, Trump quotes it endlessly and magnifies it. Yes. Okay. In my own article, I did write nice things about Trump's courses, but Trump nevertheless was upset. Again, another important part of the article. He called the editor of Golf Digest to complain, and then he called on me on my cell phone. Uh, he wasn't upset that one of the article's illustrations had been of a golf ball wearing a turf toupee that looked like him. It's <laughs> mysterious here. Or that I mentioned is asking two little girls at Mar-a-Lago if they wanted to be supermodels when they grew up. Oh. Or that I described nearly tipping him $5 after momentarily mistaking him for his club's parking lot attendant. <laughs> <laughs> or that I'd written he'd introduce one of his club members to me by, not by name, but as the richest guy in Germany. Wow. He wasn't upset about any of that. He was upset I hadn't written that he shot a 71. Aha. Uh-huh. Which is a very good golf score, one stroke under par. Mm-hmm. Well, how come? Uh, he hadn't written that because he hadn't shot 71. Oh. We hadn't been playing for score. That is to say, sometimes you go out there and you just hit the ball and, you know, you're just doing it because you want to do it. It's like when you play ping pong, but don't keep score. You're just there to converse and, you know, mm-hmm. get the ball back and try your best on individual points, but you're not really trying to, you know, I got more than you got. Yes, less, but all right. Yeah. Do that in practice. You do that with friends. We hadn't been playing for score, and we had been giving each other putts and taking other friendly liberties, as golfers inevitably do when they're just fooling around. I said something to that effect in the politest way I could think of, but he wasn't mollified. He was angry that I described this wedge shot, his wedge game, as poor. Oh. Wedge game is, I, I'm explaining this to people who never play uh, golf. I don't play golf. I will get it wrong, but I'm trying to give you an idea. I can help, yeah. A wedge game is a short game. Yes. So you use drivers and other clubs if you want to hit the ball a long way. He's really good at that. And right. then in like the mid-range, I got close, but I'm not at the green yet, so I'll use a wedge to get there and not overshoot. Maybe you use a wedge in a sand trap. Yeah. <coughs> right. When you're super close to the green, but you've just missed. If yeah, you're and- if- yeah, exactly. And then when you're on the on the green, then you might use a putter to get to where you need to be. So right. he's really good at the drives. He's really good at the putts. He has a putt. But he's really good at the putts. <laughs> yeah. He'll tell you so. He is. And, but he's not good at the mid-game there, which, by the yeah. way, uh, mirrors, you know, how he, how he uh, campaigns, too. Yes. It's also how you actually score at this game. Well, but if you want to get a lower score, you have to be good at all facets. Absolutely. On several occasions, he had trouble with uh, shots inside 100 yards. You see what I'm saying? Both mm-hmm. during our round and on the practice range beforehand. I reminded him that if I had mainly written very flattering things about his golf game and I'd mentioned his victories in three club championships and had quoted praise from his caddy and his pro, and then he gives an analogy. He says, you have a really nice bicycle, even if it's not as nice as your friend's. But none of that made any difference. He wanted the number. The fact that I hadn't published a number proved I was just like all the other reporters. I was biased, too, because we're all part of the anti-Trump media conspiracy. Never give him as much credit as he deserves for being awesome. Hmm. Such is his new familiar habit of acting like a sore loser, even when he's won. Thanks. People sometimes ask me whether Trump cheats at golf. So I've heard stories that suggest, uh, let's say, that he takes liberties. Bobby Jones would never have taken another famous golfer. Mm-hmm. But I don't think cheating is an accurate description of anything he did during the round we played. Just like I don't think lying is an accurate description of what he does when he gives a speech or answers questions at a press conference. In Trump's own mind, he really did shoot 71, if not by now, 69. Trump's world is a parallel universe in which truth takes many forms, none of them necessarily based on reality. And we all better get used to his way of thinking because for the next four years, we're going to be living in that universe too. Uh Uh-oh. So you have to take that observation and you have to match it with Margaret Sullivan's observation about what reporter's job is. And that's why she says it's going to be hellscape because none of it has anything to do with truth and reality. Yeah. Uh, I will say, I mean, I, 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 well, Owen, the writer here in the golf piece, is extraordinarily generous in saying, well, I don't know if lying is an accurate description. It, it, it is. It's an accurate description of what he does in the context of the the press conferences he gives. Uh, and, and really, I mean, it's he lies on the golf course too, but he lies in ways that are generally recognized as areas where promoters are gonna engage in puffery. This is the best golf course in the world. Well. 
you know, is it a lie? Yeah, it's not the best golf course in the world, so yes. But also it's within the range of acceptable statements for the owner of the golf course who's trying to sell it to make. Okay, so I'm going to try something here, and it may not work, so you'll have to tell me if it doesn't. And it's perfectly okay for you to say, you're a friend. You can say, you know, that was stupid, didn't work. All right. I'll... Think of it as a story. Okay? Capital S. And Donald Trump is a fabulist. He's like hmm. Baron von Munchausen. Okay. All right? Yes. So everything he does is embellished. What he sees isn't what anybody else sees when you're all in the same place at the same time. And he tells it exactly the way that he sees it. And he believes it at the time. And because he's a fabulist and because so much of it is untrue, it feels like lying is too small a word for him. And I can understand why Owen wouldn't want to use it. I can understand. There's a bigger picture here. And the bigger story is he's completely separated from the reality that you and I see. And that isn't exactly lying. Lying is the wrong word. Lying makes it sound like I'm deliberately going to tell you something I know isn't true for this one thing. It's way more than that. Well, it definitely shouldn't be mistaken for less. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yes. I mean, I don't so think it describes when you everything think of that, he does. In terms of that story narrative, I think that's the best way to approach him because then when he does stuff, it all fits into context. For example, uh, the whole story that Owen was telling about how he feels about golf reporters mm-hmm. yeah. is how he feels about political opponents. And if he says, you did this to an opponent, you know, you were corrupt or right. uh, you stole or you did this or you did whatever it is he's going to say, you get the feeling that. It happened. It was there. It was in the same room. If you or I were in the same room, we would have seen it as him stealing. But he saw it as them stealing. So he tells it that way, fully believes it, and has all the righteous anger behind it that somebody who was wronged, you know, can bring to the to the table. And it, it, it just lying just seems like a too small a word for that. Well, I think that there's a number of practices he engages in. I think lying's one of them. I think this other one is it occupies the greater portion of his life, mm. and it is bigger than lying, and it, and, and it ought to be considered worse in many ways. Uh, it's just Especially, that the, the you know, words, given the position he's supposed to be yeah, in. Yeah. The words we have for it don't carry the connotation that lying does, and you know, maybe the next four years will change that. Like when we say somebody's a fabulous, I don't know, there's something almost interesting and special about that and it's not uh, the the big heavy baggage laden word lying uh but if it's supposed to be worse we need something else and i don't know i mean most of our modifiers for things like that you can't say on the air <laughs> <It's> <laughs> this is a liar but, but again i go back to that one line yeah. that uh, owen had in his golf piece he was an honest to god authentic trump a 10 year old boy who for unknown reasons mm. had been given a real airplane and a billion dollars yeah you know and so <laughs> Uh, if that's what you're looking at, and that's how you have to treat them, you know, so be it. I guess so. I mean, it's, it's certainly an instructive story, no doubt about that. I spent a I spent a considerable amount of time mid campaign. I was just sort of fascinated for a while by the golf stories about him, uh, including the fact that he claims to be club champion at almost every one of his golf courses, plus have the course record and uh, most of the hole in ones ever made there as well. Right. You see where we're getting to with this guy. You know, I had something of a of a epiphany this weekend. Hmm. And uh, kind of a light bulb went off in my head for various and sundry reasons. Huh. But yes. I, I was thinking about this in terms of story and, and, uh, and narrative arc. And we sometimes make fun of the uh, press and the media. We do. Sometimes. I do. It happens. Know, and say, the New York Times, you're, you're not telling you're, – you're so tied up with your narrative that you're not really getting the facts right here. Hmm. Um, but narrative is important. It's a story. A story is important. And if you know the narrative and the story of Donald Trump and then put all the other uh, pieces in context with that, it's actually better for understanding than just trying to take the individual facts and then be overwhelmed with a whole bunch of, you know, like Daniel Dale used to go to his uh, rallies and list all the things he said that was bizarre or wrong, and he'd have a tweet list of about 35 things. And it's hard to integrate 35 things. But if you have the narrative that Trump is a fabulist and he's talking to the world the way he sees it and attacking people for his own flaws, and that's your narrative, then everything he says makes sense. And you don't have to remember the individual things. All right. Well, anything I could do to forget the individual things. Or is that like crazy? 
Uh, well, I'll tell you what Parlio thinks. Parlio says the word you're looking for is insanity. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that could be. He's I'm got a nice new nice. I'm a nice too. person. Okay. Well, Remember, you know, we're day, trying to be generous. This is Martin Luther King Day, and, you know, we're trying to see the best of people and trying ah. to build bridges. I'm not going to call him insane. True. Now, our, also, uh, our Canadian pundit friend, Brian Monroe, says, uh, uh, George Costanza once said on Seinfeld, it's not a lie if you believe it. Yes, exactly. There you go. That's what you were looking for. Uh, but, yeah, the, well, part. that's that's one of the reasons. Thank you very much, because I think that, that makes the point. And, yeah. and that's why I think lying is the wrong word. Well, it's an interesting word, and I think we should all discuss for hours on end every time he speaks whether or not it's the lie per se or something worse than the lie. If you want to have a discussion that way, what other words do we have? I would much for rather worse do than that than focus on the yeah. thing that he said, which is like the shiny <laughs> object, and then he's going to say another one, and everybody's going to forget about it. Right. It tells you more. It teaches you more. Well, we're getting a lot of instruction of late about how to deal with the guy. I see George Lakoff is jumping into the uh, what to do with him and his tweets game. I haven't mm-hmm. read his piece, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's for I think it's focused on journalists. And uh, I don't know whether that covers what we do or not. I will have to take a look and see whether the instruction is, is worth taking here. Right. Meanwhile, around the world, uh, while we focus on things like uh, that, uh, and uh, he tries to make the claim that none of this uh, uh, BuzzFeed uh, uh, dossier has anything to do with anything, even though there's a whole bigger picture going on. Yes. Again, that's where narrative comes in and helps keep us focused on what's going on here. Uh, Eric Garland uh, tweets, uh, while Trump screams about a dossier, intel agencies around the world are sharing many dossiers about his third. And I'm going to read a little piece here. Mm. Besides the Steele dossier, and uh, Christopher Steele, Oh, yeah. Is the uh, British spy. I got one here from the Independent. This is all from the Thunder Roundup again. Uh, former M16 agent Christopher MI6. Steele's frustration yeah. as FBI sat on. Uh, it's MI6. Not yeah, M16. it looks like I mean, it's, it's hard to tell British <laughs> ruins from their, their, uh, it's their a number. agencies here. It's MI6, yeah. the uh, spy agency. Former MI6 agent Christopher Steele's frustration as FBI sat on Donald Trump's Russia file for months. Exclusive Steele was so concerned by revelations he worked without pay after Trump's election victory in November. Uh, and, and here's a little piece. Besides the Steele dossier, several unconfirmed reports of ties between Moscow and Trump are being circulated among Western intelligence ev- uh, agencies, said one of the ir- Israeli officials mm. familiar with the reports. What I'm saying here is around the world people are looking at this, and the uh, non-American press is writing about it much more aggressively than we do. There have been various reports about Trump's ties to Russia, the officers said, in reference to other unpublished reports. The dossier is one of them, but there are others. They make other allegations. Some are more specific, some are less. You can trust me that many intelligence agencies are trying to evaluate the extent to which Trump might have ties or a weakness of some type to Russia. Forget about the golden showers. This is all, you know, it's all going to be money. This is going to be about where's the money laundering? Uh, was Russian money used to pop up uh, or prop up uh, Trump properties, uh, the ones that went sour, and so on and so forth? And we so he was showered the money, gold. and there's going to be a lot of stuff around this, and we shouldn't lose sight of that just because Trump wants to change the subject to yelling at John Lewis, right? Which is bad and should be, you know, countered. But follow the money. Okay, and and P. Mm. But, uh, you know, okay, I can't forget that part. But it was a fun introduction to it, and it's certainly great shorthand for the whole thing. But, yeah, the, yes, that's what yes. I read all weekend is, uh, well, right away, as soon as this thing broke, we started to hear that there are other intelligence agencies around the world who either have something similar or would say they would have information that corroborates this, if not having heard the same information themselves, <clears throat> Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And uh, oh, oh, other major developments over the weekend uh, that I guess we'll have to dig up some some links and sources for. I didn't put them aside, but I noticed that, uh, let's see, there was uh, the Israeli intelligence services are apparently getting nervous that, uh, that uh, Trump will, uh, well, that he'll share intelligence with the Russians that the Israelis would ordinarily be sharing with the Americans US, knowing yes. or, or, or secure in the knowledge that we wouldn't pass that on to Russia. There are some things we want to keep from them. We'll share as between ourselves, and who knows, there's probably information that they share with the Russians that they don't share with us as well when it benefits them. Uh, that's the nature of international intelligence services. 
Right. But, uh, yeah, they're getting nervous about that and, and, and Britain and as well. And other things. Here's some other things they're really getting nervous oh. about. So Russia agrees with, uh, Trump because Trump gave an interview that mm-hmm. NATO is obsolete. Uh, yes. Uh, right? Big problem. That Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel in, in Germany says that, uh, you know, we're on our own here. Yeah, and she's uh, wise to prepare for being on her own, I guess. Yeah, but that's like a big important statement. Yes, uh, only the most important, uh, strongest, largest, most impactful military alliance in the, well, I guess I would say history of the world, I think, right. at this stage with the weapons that we're carrying. But I understand also that, yeah, uh, I was saying the British intelligence is now reconsidering, uh, well, uh, or they were looking for some kind of assurances from the Trump incoming Trump administration that Trump won't out British spies in Russia because the American, well, the American president is going to have access to the, the names and identities of British undercover agents as well as American undercover agents who, who he can sim- I, I would assume that if he's going to take the, going, going to go all in pro Russia, he could either simply instruct them not to be spying or to come home or do whatever, but yeah, I guess they fear now, which is amazing, that there's some possibility that the American president, to curry favor, I suppose, with the Russian president, might turn over British spies who have been risking their lives gathering intelligence uh, on on the potential adversaries in in Russia and elsewhere for what used to be called the the West. Right. And uh, wow. Well, that would make for I mean that's a pretty serious statement right there that the Brit and and the British government is uh, well we really have to sort out where the British government stands in all of this they do occupy a kind of a strange weird middle ground in between Trump sympathetic and traditionalist right. but yeah they're, they're having a, a terrible time dealing with this uh, the, the, the I don't think they've fully come to grips with what it means to have Trump in the White House and that it's just dawning on them that there are some state secrets that Trump would be in a position to s- sell out to the Russians. If he really is closer to Russia than to Britain, there's the serious possibility of, uh, well, some people who've been serving uh, Britain for a while uh, meeting their doom, let's say. Well, you know, if you have a guy who's really a 10-year-old who just uh, yeah. for some reason has a billion dollars in an airplane, yeah, these things happen. Uh, again, last, uh, perhaps, uh, but not we'll least, see. this is um, Martin Luther King Day, and I do want to uh, honor him, his, men- his memory, oh, John Lewis, guy. who's still alive, yes. not his memory, uh, with a little inspirational here. This comes from Clarissa Piancola Estes, who I will note is an American poet, a post-trauma specialist, which is quite useful, Jungian psychoanalyst, and author of Women Who Run With the Wolves. Which, in and of itself, sounds like a fascinating book. But here is the message. My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I've heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. You are right in your assessments. The luster and humor some have aspired to while enduring, endorsing acts that so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless is breathtaking. And I have to tell you, that just offends me to my core. Uh, yet I urge you, she writes, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially, do not lose hope. Most particularly because the fact is, we were made for these times. Yes. For years, we have been learning, practicing, been in training for and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. She has more. It's a great read. She's right. Well, that's what happens when you run into a poet, I guess. Holy cow. (laughs) They they can see things that we cannot. So anyway, I just wanted to to try to uh, tie all this together and say, look, you know, we have this picture. Each one of the pieces tells us it's the same story. You have to look at Trump in that regard. It's not insulting or demeaning to say he acts like a 10-year-old and that he, he doesn't have the emotional capacity to, uh, to to deal with complex problems like an adult because that's underlying everything. And if you see that story, 
and everything else falls into place. Spending That's my story, PC. mine, and I'm sticking to it. Why not? <laughs> this is Greg Dworkin speaking with my friend David Waldman K. You're in the morning. Hope you had that pop tart. I and, did. Uh, I'm going to be fascinated to Not listen later and see what you have to say because the fun thing about the show is we never know where this is going, especially David, who actually like does the show. I literally do not. Yeah, but uh, we'll be back tomorrow and we'll do it again. Okay, very good. Thanks, Greg. We'll all see right, you then. take care. Okay, uh, all right. Soldiering on then. <clears throat> I really did have the, uh, a pop tart. I shouldn't. That's not a that's not a, a healthy breakfast per se. But for some reason, on these days when I'm not getting the kids. Uh, not squiring the kids, I guess I should say, off to school is, uh, it's extraordinarily difficult for me. I, I, I can't figure out what time to start doing things in order to get them done comfortably before showtime. That involves math, and I, I refuse to do it that early in the morning. I, I always figure, you know, how early would you have to be up? <clears throat> and the answer is always earlier. And who wants to do that if you don't have to? All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Anyway, uh, let's see. Where to go in all of this? Uh, I'm not even sure. I wanted to catch up on something. If you were watching, if you're listening live and you were watching the Twitter stream, you might have seen this thing fly by. I felt like we had to comment on it. Uh, and I mentioned, uh, I had mentioned that I'd used the word hellscape over the weekend and it had been used in connection with Laura Ingram. Not so much that she's a hellscape. I mean, she's a hellion, but not a hellscape. That wouldn't be correct usage of the word. I was thinking of, uh, her tweet over the weekend, and I understand that she has since locked her Twitter account. I don't know if she's kept it that way, but she locked it at least for some time because she was taking terrific abuse. It looks like it might be unlocked now. But she was taking – that's an interesting tactic too. I guess you just lock your Twitter account for some period of time while you're under attack. I don't really know what that does for you. It, 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 I understand the mechanics of it. Other people can't see your tweets for a while, so I guess – you won't give them more ammunition with which to attack you. But if uh, if you are being attacked and you don't like what's being said about you and you, what you know, whether rightfully or wrongfully, uh, I think the thing to do at that point is to mute people so that you won't hear their nonsense as opposed to locking your account. But who knows? Anyway, over the weekend, uh, is it still there? I don't know. I don't see it. Maybe she deleted the tweet. Anyway, she... Uh, Somewhere along the line, I guess she must have been out in New York over the weekend and she ran into, yeah, it looks like it's gone. I'm scrolling through her account. I don't see it. She, she saw a bottle of, <clears throat> of what? Of like cognac, uh, like one of those little, you know, like a, like a, uh, flask sized bottle. What do they call those little, little bottles? Uh, I'm not even sure. Anyway, of, of cognac. Such as one might slip into a hip pocket or something if one were, uh, well, in her mind, uh, this was uh, a wino's drink, a, uh, uh, a homeless person uh, uh, indulging their alcoholism on the street. But uh, it's a little pricier than most homeless folks might have indulged in and they usually uh, well i don't know i mean uh, hey i don't want to stereotype anybody but the cognac isn't necessarily the way they go on that one and that one might more likely be a club goer uh doing a little drinking before waiting online to get into one of the clubs and overpaying for their drinks inside anyway uh they couldn't even have been all that drunk because the bottle wasn't empty. Anyway, and the cap was on, and it was standing upright, and she saw it on the street. So, you know, ordinarily, a uh, discarded liquor bottle in the street is usually not a great sign. But New York is a city of millions, of course, and there are plenty of people around. Anyway, this picture she took, uh, she sent out along with the tweet tweeted comment, you know, this is Mayor de Blasio's New York, like as if, as if this were some urban decay hellscape that she was tweeting. And not only was it, A, a bottle of cognac, B, not empty, C, capped and upright, <laughs> which somehow is a little classier than you might imagine. It's, you know, not overturned in the gutter. And how many letters have I ever used? D, maybe, uh, uh, standing upright on a, like a, f a, a, a paver stoned, uh, sidewalk. It was rather upscale as garbage on the street goes. And by the way, the rest of the sidewalk was spotless and there was nobody else in view. 
And she tweeted this thing out as if it were the most horrific thing she had ever seen. And I was like, oh, my God, urban hell, uh, uh, utter hellscape, I think, is how I put it. I wonder what happens if I go looking back in my own tweet stream. Well, I see I'll see my tweet, but I don't know if I'll see hers if she deleted it. But maybe that'll tell me whether it was deleted or not. Anyway, I just saw uh, somebody, uh, I, I thought, referencing what well, must have been referencing that tweet uh, showing what an urban hellhole uh, John Lewis's district in uh, in Atlanta was. Oh, here I can. I got the chain. But yeah, it says this tweet is unavailable. So I imagine she must have deleted it because it got a lot of people on our case, and rightly so. Cameron McWhorter this morning, this morning, uh, a Wall Street Journal reporter, by the way, based in Atlanta, is it this morning or or when was this tweet? Let's see if I can scroll back to find the year. Yeah, one day ago. So yesterday, Crime Watch in Representative John Lewis's district, this napkin on the ground in Oakhurst Park. Why won't the federal government do anything? Hashtag P. Otis, but only one E on that one. I guess he went around looking for crime in the district here also because he knew he wouldn't find it. Of course, dispatched from crime infested Representative John Lewis's district. We'll keep reporting as long as I can. Little library with no Penguin Classics inside. You know, one of those little uh, take any book you like kind of uh, public spaces. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, well, you know, what can you, what, what do you know about this woman? Anyway, she, she deleted that tweet. Obviously, the napkin needed to be sent out to her along with the May Day message so that she could see just what a brutal hellscape Atlanta's 5th District, or Georgia's 5th District in Atlanta really is. And I guess everybody got the joke, too, because they're passing it on as well. All right. Let's see. Another thing I saw this morning, by the way, uh, where did I see this one? Did I open it and leave it open? Was I smart in organizing? Probably not. But I think I can, once again, use my own tweet stream to find out uh, what the hell I was talking about and what <laughs> where this thing went. Adam Kahn who uh, has a rather sizable following on Twitter as Connoisseur, get it, Con, uh, sent out uh, this b- piece of information today. Let's see, referencing the a tweet from, from someone else. <sighs> Going back, uh, let's see. Dang it, you know, uh, uh, these threaded tweets are terrific for laying out a lengthy narrative, but they make it awfully difficult to find out uh, where the the statement you originally wanted to quote is in this chain once the chain grows. Here's Adam Kahn's tweet crediting Eddie Chavez for this one. Wow, great find, he says. Apprentice team performed editorial gymnastics to cover up his bizarre incoherence. Let's uh, check in on Eddie Chavez and make sure we... Uh, can figure out uh, who we're talking about here. Let's see. Uh, he says, uh, well, well, interesting. Hmm. Well, he seems to be quite the connoisseur fan himself. Um, just your uh, regular average Joe tweeter. Not a, not even a totally awesome verified dude like uh, Adam Kahn and so many others that we know. Uh, just a just regular tweeter like you and me. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, and I guess he's following the same sort of storyline. But it was interesting. He picked up on an article that Adam found very interesting and which I found very similar to an article we had read on the air earlier. So I took the opportunity anyway to say, hey, uh, Kegger in the Morning listeners, you would already have known this for some time. Eddie Chavez sent around this article. Let's take a look at it along with the comment. Uh, let's see. Hmm. This could be why Braun, editor for The Apprentice, said they were told to make Trump look wealthy and legitimate, linking to an article in, uh, well, uh, a page called realityblurred.com. You remember, of course, that we read the piece some time ago in Cinemontage that was entitled Editing Trump, The Making of a Reality TV Star Who Would Be President. I don't recall whether we read it before the election or after or maybe both, but the piece we read was from October 12th 
of last year. And my my recollection is that we didn't read it uh, the day of publication. That we it's one of the pieces we kept in the wings for a while. And I don't know if we kept it long enough to make it uh, an after election piece. But you recall, and we frequently reference the fact that the idea of the television show The Apprentice was to make America, for whatever reason, for, at that point it was for the success of the show itself, to make money with the show. I don't think anybody had any longer-term thoughts about that or uh, the idea of, well, we'll use this show to make him presidential necessarily. But certainly the idea was this show's success depends on our ability to trade on Donald Trump's old reputation as a brilliant businessman and extraordinarily rich individual, and we're going to do that. It's important to the validity of this reality TV show, such as it might have any, uh, such as it might have, let's say, uh, that, uh, that he, one, be regarded as rich and successful, and two, be made to look like it makes sense that he's rich and successful. Remember how much of the generic we-need-a-businessman-in-politics meme and how much of the uh, prosperity gospel-style meme of if you are rich, it's because you are hardworking and smart. And just as we read the other day, uh, I guess on Friday we were discussing with Armando the, uh, the interview with the retired farmer who said what so many people often say about people like this, about people like Donald Trump and the billionaires with which he's filling his cabinet, that these people must be smart. You have to be smart to be a billionaire. You see, this is all part and parcel of building that narrative. So we had read a piece from A.J. Cataline, right, uh, in Cinemontage, laying out the basics from the at least this one editor's perspective that the task was, well, first of all, that the task was to make him look like the successful businessman he wanted everyone to think he was. And two, that they had had, that they had to make a conscious decision as to whether or not this was going to be presented as a campy comedy or some sort of aspirational American dream type show and that it could have gone either way based on the actual footage but they decided to edit it into a serious thing this is and and they weren't even sure that they had done that successfully nor had they definitely decided even by the end of season one whether this was a comedy and and even though the direction was we want to lean more towards the serious it, it seems like it was the understanding of the insiders on the production team that very few people would really be able to take this seriously. Everyone would see through the, 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 the goofiness, the over the topness, the, the very Trumpiness of it all and be able to take it for what it was worth. Okay. It's entertainment and it's got a, you know, uh, an entrepreneurial theme to it, but Donald Trump is a caricature of himself and everyone would understand that. But instead, by the end of the run, uh, it had been taken mysteriously by much of America to mean that, uh, and maybe it was because of the label reality TV, it really should have been in scare quotes the whole time, uh, they came away with the impression that no, he really was this thing and that this really was something worth being, which is amazing. Anyway, there's a new entry in that genre coming from this reality blurred publication. Let's take a look at that one and uh, just remind ourselves of this in ways that uh, are different somehow from what I just did, which <laughs> which really means reading this article as opposed to my uh, telling you pretty much what it's going to say. Anyway, I don't know. Somehow this might reinforce things or give us a new angle. On all this reality blurred is what? It is a, I guess it's a reality TV blog. Uh, from what it looks like up at the banner head here, reality TV shows, reviews, uh, schedule, 
uh, etc. So I think it's just sort of a blog about reality TV shows, which we should probably explore uh, more widely at some point uh, to explain the rest of the world, because obviously we're just going to have reality TV stars uh, running every country at some point. Apprentice editors covered for Donald Trump, and so did I. Well, we've already n- learned the story of apprentice editors covering for Donald Trump. Who is I, and what have you got to say for yourself? This is Andy Denhart uh, writing here, and uh, the picture, the the piece is illustrated with the a photo, not unlike. Did, didn't we see this one in the editing Trump one? Yeah, uh, is it the same one? It's credited here, courtesy 2004, courtesy NBC. Uh, not credited. Oh no, photo by. It says photo by David, and that's not me. And it's linked. Let's see who's who's David. It's a Flickr photo. Okay, so somebody took a picture of clearly the same banner, just a uh, a, a private. I don't know whether an amateur photographer or a professional, but anyway, the banner of the Apprentice show that uh, Trump and NBC printed up, and that Trump strung across the uh, the doorway of Trump Tower. You remember from our reading of the Cinemontage piece how. Remarkable, I thought that really was. And uh, again, a- another illustration, I think we said at the time, of the way Trump tends to conflate uh, the the personal uh, things that he personally owns and things with uh, that he has a, uh, a temporary custody of. Or uh, <clears throat> and I mean, he clearly has ownership, obviously, of the of Trump Tower. It's just uh Hmm. I don't know how to put it. It just, it just seems like audacious to uh, create advertising space where none was supposed to exist. Although the fact that the thing is plastered Trump Tower, I guess it would be hard to argue that nobody contemplated that as advertising. Anyway, let's get to the reality blurred piece and stop psychoanalyzing the insanity of putting a giant banner with a picture of you on your own building that already has your name on it. Andy Denhart has this to write. Just over 12 years ago, I wrote a piece asking, what's with Trump's weird voiceovers? Where did he write this? Maybe this will give us a clue as to who Andy Denhart is. I think so. This is on today.com. That would be the Today Shows, NBC's Today Shows uh, website. And here's Andy Denhart. Now, this is his piece. This is from October of 2004. Uh, and it's uh, bylined Andy Denhart, msnbc.com. So is he a journalist? Is he a, I don't know what, doesn't tell me anything. Um, is, is Andy Denhart a famous guy and I don't know it? Now I'm stuck with the pinwheel. Anyway, this is his current piece. Just over 12 years ago, I wrote this piece asking what's with Donald Trump's weird voiceovers, discussing the star of NBC's The Apprentice. I wrote that it's Quote, boardroom is also where that billionaire Donald Trump shines and where, quote, he demands answers and casts judgments, unquote, and, quote again, sometimes irrational decision making, unquote, was on display. But there was something unusual. And this is a quote from the 2004 piece, I believe. Listen carefully during the boardroom sequences, especially when Trump issues his rationale for firing. And you'll notice that the sound quality and audio changes frequently. While Trump speaks in a weird, slower overlord voice, we don't see his face and hair, but instead watch reaction shots of the candidates, George and Carolyn. This guy, I guess, goes way back. It seems apparent that some of the audio is being dubbed, replaced by voiceovers, Trump records later. And it's a good point. I don't know whether people who are avid fans of the show remember it. I don't know whether they noticed it at the time. It's not an unusual television or cinematic technique. It's something we're used to seeing. And the editors knew very well that we wouldn't be totally weirded out by it. And it would take something of a, you know, you'd have to remove yourself from the moment to even take note of the fact that these judgments were being delivered as voiceovers and you were watching reaction shots. And if you take it apart correctly, you'll reach the same conclusion Andy does here. It seems apparent that some of the audio is being dubbed, replaced by voiceovers that Trump records later. Are these redubbed lines scripted? 
re-recorded to be smoother than the original version? If not, why is the production so bad that Trump's audio cuts out so frequently, both in the boardroom and elsewhere? We now, of course, thanks to the Cinemontage piece, know the answer. Yes, it was scripted and it was re-edited after the fact to make his decisions appear to make more sense. Not a luxury he'll have available to him in the real world, of course. This was among the earliest instances, his article continues, I, that I'd observed uh, of what's now a common practice, recording new audio in post-production and, and then layering it over actual footage to make it seem like it was spoken in the moment. As with any editing technique, it can be used ethically or to completely change reality. And it's interesting, uh, as ethics goes, just to take a pause here, I wouldn't be surprised if actual, like, honest-to-God degreed and studied ethicists wouldn't wonder whether the ethical nature of doing that changes over time in this example. Like, for instance, if he just stays a reality TV show, is there anything unethical about the editing? If so, I would think they would consider it to be a very mild breach of ethics uh, in the context of even reality TV. We, we were supposed to understand this as entertainment first and reality in name only. But in the context of, yes, such a person, if they really existed, would make an excellent leader of the free world and we ought to experiment with that. Well, then at that point, I guess the ethics of it changes. Uh, it's no longer in the context, being considered in the context of producing acceptable entertainment or even aspirational entertainment, even if it, even if it's supposed to carry a political message. But the idea of editing a presidential candidates, what, what, what passes for, because he has no other real history, what passes for Donald Trump's background and history and establishes his qualifications for president to have edited that now, of course, in hindsight, looks considerably less ethical, let's say, than it might have at the time. So what was happening on The Apprentice? Twelve years later, thanks to Donald Trump's run for the presidency as the Republican Party's nominee, we have an answer. And by the way, this piece uh, from Andy Denhart is written on 7 November, very faithfully, uh, filed 7, 9, it's important to tell you, 9.57 p.m. So late at night on, uh, on November 7th, so basically on the guy's way you know, winding down the night before election day, this guy is writing this. So that's the context. Very interesting. Because it might be considerably more vitriolic afterwards. And I bet the comments <laughs> reflect that later. So what was happening on The Apprentice 12 years later, thanks to Donald J. Trump's... It didn't say Donald J. I inserted the J and I should be inserting a P. Donald P. Trump's run for the presidency as the Republican Party's nominee. We have an answer. How Apprentice's editing... Covered up for Trump is the next section of the article. Ah, and guess what it references? Cinemontage. Cinemontage, the journal of the Motion Picture Editors Guild, published a story last month that I missed until hearing its author, A.J. Cataline, discussing it on the Jay and Tony show show. Really? Show show? Is that, is that the name of the show? Now, uh, now things are starting to hmm, ring about. Did we, by any chance, I'll have to look back and listen to the show, did we find the Cinemontage piece by finding this piece? I can't, again, I can't recall whether we read Cinemontage before or after the election. If it was before, then we couldn't have scum, scumbled. That's an interesting uh, portmanteau. There are, stumbled on this piece if we read before the election. And uh, nothing in my in the history indicates you know wasn't purpled in my uh, in the links here. So I it's not I, I don't know if my history contains any uh, reference to this URL or anyway. Uh, but it would make some sense. So Cinemontage, uh, a major source for this. Cataline interviewed editors who worked on The Apprentice, of course, from 2004 to 2007. One of them, Jonathan Braun, A.C.E., <laughs> that carries over into here, 
Remember that one? Said they were told to, quote, make Trump look good, make him look wealthy, legitimate. It's interesting that you had to make, I mean, that's going to be a surprise to some people. Even people who understood that he was a buffoon probably thought, well, the guy is wealthy. You can't tell me he's not. Just as we were discussing again at the end of last week, the uh, Trump supporters' idea of fake news is that which claims that Trump, the guy who has that airplane and at least claims to have a billion dollars and for all the world lives a lifestyle that looks like he must, how can you say he's not rich? I get your point. It's complicated and it might be difficult to explain to you, <laughs> but I can't condescend to you. So what am I going to do? That's the uh, the catch 22 of dealing with the Trump supporter at this point. OK, so make Trump look good, make him look wealthy and legitimate. That was our objective. But that's what we do as editors anyway. Right. Right. So it wasn't unethical at the time you were editing a television show, editing reality with respect to whether or not this guy should be a president. That might be less ethical. Part of their task was to ensure that Trump's decision making makes sense. As those of us who watched The Apprentice know, and as a different unidentified editor told the magazine, Trump would often make arbitrary decisions which had nothing to do with people's merit. He'd make decisions based on whom he liked or disliked personally, whether it be for looks or lifestyle, or he'd keep someone that would make good TV. The editors had to fix this with what Cinemontage called editorial gymnastics that proved a tremendous feat with Trump. Braun said the team of editors would have to reverse engineer the show to make it look like his judgment had some basis in reality. Sometimes it would be very hard to do because the person he chose did nothing. We had to figure out how to edit the show to make it work, to show the people he chose to fire as looking bad, even if they had done a great job. Trump's frequent lies also presented a problem. Braun explained, he would say things like, we had a million applicants and we chose this small group to be contestants on the show, Braun recalled. And I would turn to my producer and say, a million applicants, really? And the producer would shake his head, no. Trump would just take numbers and throw them around. I mean, from season one to season two, he said his net worth tripled. One day he said he had a billion dollars and later it would become three billion dollars. He just made stuff up. Sound familiar? We are asked here back in the reality blurred piece. Yes, it does. I mean, it, for us, it sounds familiar because we just read the quote we had discussed earlier when we read the cinema montage piece. But still, you get the point. If you are just joining us at Kegro in the Morning World Headquarters now and have never listened to the show before, it still sounds familiar, doesn't it? Trump's propensity to exaggerate. This is the best golf course ever. I'm not lying. Because I was just told I was not a liar, but something worse. But we have no worse word for it. So there you go. Trump's propensity to exaggerate, to distort, and to outright lie about the most basic, obviously false things is now common knowledge. Donald Trump lies so much. Almost 500 different lies over the past few months, as one analyst, uh, one analysis found, that his active denial of reality is the status quo now. Just watch Trump's version of reality versus actual footage of the event he's describing. Oh, what are they linking to here? I'm just curious. Let's take a look and open up the link. This is over at The Concourse, which is a dead spin piece. Did Donald Trump watch the same Obama speech? We all did. This is from November 5th. Uh, and uh, let's see. What is this one? Hmm. Yesterday, a Trump protester interrupted the president's appearance at a Hillary Clinton rally in North Carolina, prompting Obama to quiet down a rowdy crowd and urge it to respect the man's right to free speech. That's a radical difference from the Trump approach already, but the GOP nominee saw things differently, accusing Obama of screaming at the protester and that the whole scene was a disgrace. Then you are urged to watch the video above and you make the call. I don't think we need to watch the video. Even if you don't remember it, in all likelihood, we will see a very calm, no drama Obama not screaming at anybody. But so what? The guy with the... Uh, P-colored hair says he was screaming, so I guess that's all we're supposed to take away from that. Watching The Apprentice, back to Reality Blurred. Watching The Apprentice, I was entertained by the contestants, the tasks, and yes, Donald Trump. 
But it also now seems clear that the show, and viewers like me, enabled and encouraged the worst in him. So congratulations to those of you who, like me, never watched The Apprentice, and we can't be blamed for having enabled him by watching The Apprentice. We can be blamed for enabling him in other ways, which is good. Everyone should have a share in this. Next section, the reality of watching Donald Trump. Over the past few months, a few readers have directly communicated that I should avoid political stories. And by that, they meant my coverage of The Apprentice, which I wrote about when Donald Trump's behavior on that show became news as part of the election. My coverage ranged from an accusation that he'd sexually assaulted an apprentice candidate to an unfair attempt to blame him for language in the show's contract. Oh, is that the, uh, you have to be able to... You have to allow us to show you naked if necessary. You remember that story? I think we discovered that about the same time as the cinemontage piece. Maybe that's how we came across the cinemontage piece. Perhaps that's the linkage I'm thinking of. Anyway, I understand the discomfort that comes from being confronted with facts that do not make one's candidate look good. And perhaps it's especially discomforting to come across that kind of information when reading about reality television. So here's a disclaimer. Discomfort ahead. Turn it off if you don't want to hear it. I can't imagine why you would be listening to this show, but uh, you're fairly warned. I was hooked on The Apprentice, he says, from its first season, drawn to its urban version of Survivor. Oh, see, Survivor was a was a rural show. And, hmm, okay, see, um, uh, why don't we respect that? See, once again, we condescended to the rural folks and then just said, let's go back to the cities and make our own show. Well, how despicably elite of us. I wonder if we, if there's some way we can identify someone responsible for it and string them up. From the tasks that challenged the contestants to the boardroom and Trump's final verdict, it was engrossing television. I would disagree, but okay. In December, oh, I'm sorry, December, no. In 2011, uh, Donald Trump, that's the D word, I guess I must have made me think of December. In 2011, however, Donald Trump crossed a line denying that Barack Obama was born in Hawaii and even absurdly claiming that Obama, quote, came out of nowhere and was never seen at law school. Okay. This was not Donald Trump expressing a political view I disagreed with. This was Trump denying factual reality and doing so to challenge the legitimacy of a black president. And yes, the president's race has everything to do with the birther movement because it's fueled by racism, as researchers have found. Trump was encouraging racists and encouraged by them, he became increasingly emboldened even as he tried to pretend otherwise. Yet I continued to watch and cover The Apprentice. Some readers commented publicly and privately that they'd given up and wondered why I was still giving attention to Donald Trump and his show. It was a fair question, and it is. That's interesting. I'm sure for an entertainment reporter, they were like, well, it's still on the air, and I can understand why they would feel it was still necessary to cover them. But yeah, hmm. it's a good question. And certainly in hindsight, uh, well, historians will ask when I ask people, well, why did you allow him, if, if, if the television show was what made him such a big star, why did you continue to validate the television show? Like right now, at this stage of the game, and even without Donald Trump, the Donald Trump phenomenon having happened, it would be difficult to imagine... There not being a major backlash and possible boycott of a show which was otherwise relatively apolitical, you know, certainly uh, didn't delve into electoral politics directly as a theme of the show, where if the star of the show, particularly if it was, you know, if you had that one fewer layers, one one fewer barrier between the reality and the entertainment sides of the show, right? If uh, if it's a reality TV star who, in character, essentially, says something overtly political and overtly offensive to a large swath of the country, the majority of the country, I think we can feel safe in saying, there would be an enormous backlash and the guy would either be off the air or find the ratings dwindling. And, you know, it might take two, three years to finally kill him off, but... <clears throat> It would be gone. So historians will look back and say, why did you continue to pretend that this was just a, you know, that this was acceptable entertainment after the star of the show in a reality capacity said this awful thing? And I guess it was because, I don't know, we, uh, why, did, why did the media 
continue to cover birtherism in the way that they did. I don't know. I think we're all here. We are all at fault in some way, in some portion anyway. So why were they still covering Donald Trump? It was a fair question. He writes, eventually I wrote about this, how to watch and enjoy the apprentice, even though Donald Trump is an ass. (laughs) And so he has, and where does this one appear? Let's just check in. I like, I like the links in this one. You will too. I'll, Oh, and it was in reality blurred as well. So you can read all the linked articles when we, uh, uh, when Scott, uh, puts together the daily summary. Thank you very much, Scott. And you can take a look at the reality blurred piece and read all the links out of there. One of the reasons I gave at the time was, quote, all the good the show does in terms of, <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. You're not going to believe where, where this one goes. All the, one of the reasons I gave, at the time was all the good the show does in terms of raising money for charity. Holy mackerel. And that reminds me what story I have to cover next. The Celebrity Apprentice, as the show was uh, by that point known, I guess, was not just about bolstering Donald Trump's brand, but it was about giving. And Trump himself often showered charities with his own money. (laughs) But he knows. Don't worry. Except... The next paragraph begins, he did not. As we learned from the exceptional reporting over the past few months, Trump never once paid what he promised. The money he said he'd pay personally came either from the production or his foundation. We forgot about that angle of it. There was a lot of money that went to things which passed for charities and some of which are indeed charities in fact, in the traditional sense which not only didn't come from his pocket, but didn't even come from the foundation, but they came from NBC. The part of his contract was that they had to give him money to give away to people on the show because he has, he sensed correctly, people loved this part of the show. And even for a while, anyway, fooled our writer here, who by all, uh, well, at every instance, he has shown us, Andy has, that he knows exactly what's going on. Everything that occurs to me, like, well, what about this? Does he know about this? Uh, how could he write such a thing? Well, yeah, in the very next paragraph, he proves he's well aware. So uh, this is a guy who's on the ball here. And he was fooled at the time. Very interesting. I think we all were, to some extent. I guess anybody who thought Donald Trump was just a clown at any point was fooled in the same way. Even Even as we stood there as I know we did during the campaign, and said, yeah, but Reagan, and gosh, this makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so there it was. He was actually impressed by what appeared to be the show raising and distributing money for charity, except, of course, as he says, he's, he did not. Trump never paid what he promised. The money either came from the production or his foundation, to which he has not contributed since The Celebrity Apprentice debuted. In other words, he took credit for giving away other people's money. But my primary argument was that The Apprentice always held Donald Trump up as a hypocritical, ridiculous reality show cast member who has more ego than self-awareness. So the show was mocking him, and so could we. No harm done. If only. On Sunday's Last Week Tonight, John Oliver said that Trump has, quote, unleashed a river of racism and misogyny. Trump certainly didn't create either, but by being so publicly and unashamedly racist and misogynistic, he gave others permission to be that way more publicly than before. And remember, this is written prior to the election. His candidacy has fueled incredible hatred. Saturday, at a rally in Tampa, A mother and her children protesting were escorted out, and Trump's supporters kicked her son's wheelchair. He has cerebral palsy, we are reminded. Another supporter wore a t-shirt that advocated lynching journalists, never mind how much relentless harassment journalists who cover Trump's rallies have been subjected to. There's also a surge of Trump-fueled anti-Semitism. There are endless examples, and of course we only saw worse after the election, right? The river is flowing, and it is horrifying. And to watch The Apprentice in its later years was to see the dam leaking. And herein, he now includes a creepy Trump, a clip from the show. Creepy Trump tells Apprentice contestant, ah, yes, I remember seeing this one, must be a pretty picture, you on your knees, because he's talking to a, uh, uh, a young woman with long blonde hair. 
uh, in a uh, one shoulder off the shoulder dress here. I don't even know who that is, but there you go. Hmm. Well, we certainly heard plenty about that kind of Trump. It's one thing to watch the irrational decisions. The article continues the desperate need for validation, the dismissal of his own responsibility. I really had no choice and laugh. But it was another to see things such as objectification of women and denial of facts and moments like the above, that clip I was just telling you about, and keep watching because the rest was entertaining. To observe his vile treatment of Rosie O'Donnell, which went beyond criticism to personal insults based on her body and sex. What created Trump and allowed his rise is complex and more than I fully understand. But I now deeply regret watching The Apprentice while looking the other way at behavior like his sexism and racist pandering. Too many people, I fear, are doing that now. Again, pre-election. I know that tomorrow or during the past few weeks, many people will vote because of the early voting for Donald Trump because he has an R next to his name. Others will vote for him because they cannot stand Hillary Clinton, both because of her own mistakes and because of the ire she earns for being ambitious, for whatever reason, that uh, earns her uh, ire. And uh, a, a link to another outside piece here. And transgressing expectation, transgressing expectations about a woman's role in our society. How angry that makes me. My objection to Trump and my horror over his rise over the past year has nothing to do with policy or with political party. It has to do with human decency. Uh-oh. Eight years ago, when a woman at a town hall told John McCain that Barack Obama is, quote, an Arab, he is not, she was, uh, he, I guess I was not trying to say not American. She was interrupted by McCain, who said, no, ma'am, he's a decent family man and citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is about. That's what a campaign should be about. Disagreements, often passionate, often even angry. That's democracy. But from day one of his campaign, when Trump said Mexican immigrants, they're rapists. Right? Trump has made his run for the presidency about hating other people and encouraging hatred of others. He's demonstrated that he feels entitled to not just to unlimited power, but also to women's bodies to assault them and do whatever he likes. That did not start with The Apprentice, but The Apprentice empowered Trump. And then Trump became liquid fuel poured on the embers of bigotry and misogyny. I should have fired Trump's version of The Apprentice from my DVR and recaps long ago. And I hope that on Tuesday, uh -oh, the country will choose to do what I did not. Well, they didn't. It's not your fault, but I understand what you're doing. And I think uh, well placed you know, to, to wonder whether... Some of that, in fact, isn't your fault and or the fault of all who uh, set aside the obvious flaws in favor of the entertainment value or justified it in saying, well, surely America sees the buffoon that he really is. Well, I guess I guess we didn't. Well, you and I did, but not enough voters did. All right. <clears throat> Let's see a few other things here that... Uh, we can go back to, oh, I, 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 now I'm trying to think, what was it that popped up in the middle of our reading that made me say, oh yes, there's uh, something else we need to go to. And I got to scroll back. I should have made a note to myself. I knew I would forget this. Uh, oh yes, the charity issue. That's right. It's back. It's back. Uh, David Farenthold, I guess, uh, I know he's got a new-ish assignment that's based on the success he had chasing down the information uh from the uh from the foundation and 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 he's got an you know so that that's all squared away but i guess he could go straight back to this thing uh, apparently uh word is you know that uh also early on this show uh flagged the inaugural committee the presidential inaugural committee's uh weird flexibility with reporting requirements over at the FEC. You'll recall that presidential inaugural committees have an obligation to report to the FEC the contributions they receive, although the report isn't due until 90 days after the inauguration. So 
you have a built-in opportunity to let the embers cool before the information starts coming out. And it's uh, it looks like old news by the time most media organizations will get access to the list of donors. But somewhat more important, perhaps, is that there's no requirement from the FEC, anyway, to report on the disbursements of the monies. And I did have people point out that presidential inaugural committees are organized usually. And I think it is, uh, I do believe I've seen that it's the case for, uh, for Trump's as well. Trump's presidential inaugural committee goes under the name of the, uh, what, what is it? The 58th presidential inaugural committee is, I believe, the official name, in case you're looking for uh, a way to verify this for yourself. But I believe they are organized as a 501c4 organization, which eventually will require, quote-unquote require, who knows whether it will be required once Trump is president, but uh, has historically required the filing of Form 990s with the IRS, at the very least, And so I guess at some point there will have to be, if they're in compliance with the law, a 990 filed. I don't know when it's due. I mean, it might not be due for a year. Uh, I don't know that presidential inaugural committees are in a big hurry to file those, but there have been some filed in the past that are publicly available over the Internet. And they do give some limited information about expenditures of funds, but it's very often pretty nonspecific. And, of course, Donald Trump is very familiar with uh, the process by which you can establish new corporate entities that tend to mask where the money has eventually landed, right? You can, If you want to, you can certainly give your newly formed corporations names that identify them as Trump entities, and you can also obscure the Trumpiness of the entity with it just by giving it a different name. So it will take some detective work after the fact and the, and the work can't even begin for some time after the inauguration, by which point there will almost certainly be evidence of bigger and more important pieces of the corruption puzzle to explore. But uh, if you're interested, and maybe David Farenthold is, uh, if you hang on and wait long enough, you'll probably at some point be able to piece together just how much of the inaugural committee's money ended up in Donald Trump's pockets. So we'll wait and see about that. In the meantime, um, the latest reporting is that Trump's uh, inaugural committee has taken in a record sum. Uh, north of $90 million, as I understand it. I wonder whether I put that aside or not. Let me uh, scoot around and pocket and see if I put that aside somewhere. And that's a record, uh, I think, pretty much shattering the old records. And I think it was Obama who set the old records. Uh, and with the enormous amount of money Obama raised, and didn't use all of, by the way, there was a significant surplus from his 2009 inauguration, um, but I think that total was in the neighborhood of about oh, somewhere around two thirds to three quarters of what Trump has raised here. I think it was in the $60 million range. Anyway, Trump now, uh, I guess has been asked about this and what are you going to be doing with all of this money if you are putting on either a, well, uh, what's been variously described as a smaller, low-key inaugural affair or laughed at as one that couldn't attract any A-level talent or laughed at as one that was being described as having a soft sensuality, et cetera, et cetera. What are you going to do with the extra money is the big question. And, of course, he has said that he would be donating it to charity, which, of course, we <laughs> have to question at this point. And I believe, I didn't I, I didn't even put it aside, which is amazing. But I did see, I think, Farenthold, David Farenthold, tweeting about that. We'll scroll back and see if we can't discover it towards uh, it's probably Saturday, early in the weekend. Um, 
Yeah, here it is. I found it pretty quickly. How amazing for me. I never. It always takes longer than that. David Farenthold tweeting two days ago. Uh, and let's open it up so that we can include it in the roundup. Wow, it begins again. Uh, Real Donald Trump, using the Twitter handle here, can you tell us what charities you plan to help? He is referring to a tweet from Alex Howard. Alex Howard tweets as Digifile, in case uh, the name is not immediately familiar to you, Deputy Director of the Sunlight Foundation, of all things. Can you believe it? Uh, and he, Alex, notes that the president-elect uh, says the presidential inaugural committee has raised a record $90 million plus in private donations, according to AP News. And the AP piece herein quoted by Nancy Benak. Let's see how she pronounces that name when they call and complain about that one. B-E-N-A-C. Nancy wrote, the inauguration of a new president requires the recitation of a 35-word oath. That's it. Dress it up with some hoopla and glitz, though, and pretty soon you're talking real money. Donald Trump will have it to spend. Trump's presidential inaugural committee has raised a record $90 million plus in private donations, far more than President Barack Obama's two inaugural committees. They collected $55 million in 2009 and $43 million in 2013 and had some left over on the first go-round. Very interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, there's some more later on from Alex. Uh, let's see. He says that the president-elect hasn't said which charities will, tr will receive extra inaugural funds. That's because he's got no idea and just came up with it, as usual. Whenever he's cornered on something, and it be it's, this is interesting. What an interesting weakness this is. Um, we forget about this, but maybe, I don't know, we'll have to put it aside and to, and study it a little bit and see whether it's exploitable. But there is a way to make Donald Trump self-conscious about his wealth, which is not something we ordinarily think of being a possibility. But whenever it comes up that, well, you say you're such a super rich guy, why are you doing this other thing which is very clearly aimed at bringing in yet more money and personal profit to you. If you already have more money than you know what to do with, why, why, why are you doing this? This is a question that I, I, the first time I'm aware of it came up in the context of writing the book or having someone else write the book, The Art of the Deal. And for some reason he felt awkward about the idea of, well, if, I, if the book is about how wealthy and successful I am, why do I need to keep the proceeds of a new book about how wealthy and successful I am. And somehow, for whatever reason, that moved him to claim that he would be giving all the profits. And that's, by the way, he, he's also very clever in, in promising profits versus all of the revenues or all of the proceeds of the sales of a book to charity because that's considerably more money and he can weasel his way out of profits much easier. Anyway, uh, for whatever reason, he felt uncomfortable saying, hell with you. I mean, I'm the world's most ridiculous ultra capitalist. What am I doing with the money? I'm keeping it. Why do I need extra money? I don't. I just want to die with more than you. I, I want all the money. And for some reason, he feels uncomfortable saying that. And I wonder what we can do with that. But instead, he claims, oh, I'm going to give the money to charity. And some of the money, in his mind, here, here I'm willing to say, uh, I don't think he necessarily understands what he's doing as lying in all this, but uh, it's been made clear to him and now, and he continues to do it anyway. At this point, of course, it becomes lying. But, uh, you know, he wants to put on the show of giving some of this away. He's, he's not willing, for whatever reason, to simply say, I'm keeping it all. I wonder what that is and what that means and how we can use that. Anyway, it's also something he's done before and uh, it, more egregiously, I think, uh, he wasn't even cornered about anything uh, with respect to the veterans money, he just had to give an excuse as to why he wasn't showing up at this debate. And the, the real reason was that Megyn Kelly was going to be moderating it. And he was at that point mad at Megyn Kelly. So I'm not going to the debate. And what are you going to do? Well, the best thing he could think of, what's a good excuse for missing a debate? Uh, you know, I'm uh, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm washing nuns feet. That's one. I'm helping children, childhood cancer patients do it. And he could have thought of that, too, because apparently that's something Eric Trump spends a considerable amount of his time 
uh, doing, although he does it in the Trumpian way. And, you know, you could wish for better, certainly, but I think he's got a better track record on getting money to legitimate charities than his dad does anyway. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, so he, he used the excuse of raising money for, uh, veterans, charities, and then, of course, he instead tried to keep the money himself and use it to his own ends through the foundation. In his mind, that's charity, and everybody else's mind, and the people who, will, who, you know, turn the jail keys know that that's not really using it for charity, but, but he's rich and white, and what can you do? Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, he's got quite a history. Every time he feels embarrassed about this new source, some new source of wealth, uh, he pretends he's going to give it away. And so now he's doing the same thing. What are you doing with all this money? You got twice as much money as anybody's ever raised for an inauguration and only half the number of things that recent presidents have been able to do planned for your inauguration. What are you going to do with the excess money? Oh, well, I'm going to give it away. To charity, because that's a thing people say when they're embarrassed about having money. And it works for me. But he's now uniquely in a position for it not to work, of course. So let's see. Alex's second tweet here, President-elect has not said which charities will receive the extra funds. Um, this, I guess, from further on down in the AP piece. Let's see. Obama used his excess inaugural dollars to help pay for the White House Easter egg roll and other events in his first term. Trump hasn't specified what charities might benefit from any leftovers, but some of the past pledges to donate to charity haven't always immediately panned out. That's a kind way of saying it. Trump's committee has 90 days after the inauguration to reveal its donors, although some presidents have reported donations as they came in. A few contributors are already known. Among the corporate donors, Boeing has given a million dollars and Chevron half a million. AT&T says it has made both cash and in-kind contributions, including... Uh, and it cuts off there, but as I recall, the inclusion is the quintupling of uh, telephone capacity on the National Mall. I guess that means probably cell phone capacity. Uh, let me pop on over to the AP article itself so that we're not cut off. Uh, is there anything that we've missed? Uh, there's the mention of the soft sensuality comment from the inaugural committee chair. Uh, but let's see. Anything else? Uh, oh, uh, I found this interesting too. Right. Trump is holding three inaugural balls. Obama had 10 at his first inaugural. Trump's team also hopes to keep its parade to 90 minutes. The longest parade with 73 bands and 59 floats lasted more than four and a half hours at Dwight Eisenhower's first inauguration in 1953. Good trivia there. The president-elect's inaugural team has also failed to attract the kind of A-list performers who turned out in force for Obama. Trump's announced headliners are teen singer Jackie Evancho. She's still sticking with that, I think. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Radio City Rockettes. Uh, over the weekend, by the way, some of the other... Pro uh, we've now seen a couple of performers who actually agreed publicly early on to perform pulling out of the show. That's pretty interesting in itself. What else have we here? Uh, oh, yes, this was interesting because of who shows up in the spokesman, Boris Epstein. Remember him? He's back in the news. He said the inaugural committee is, quote, fully focused on organizing world-class events that honor our nation's tremendous history. He loves to speak like the boss. And reach every corner of the globe. Any excess money raised will be donated to charity. Then there was a note that uh, Obama used some of the extra to pay for the White House Easter egg roll and other events in his first term. Uh, this, according to, it says Kerrigan. I don't know who, we'll scroll back and see if we can figure out who uh, Kerrigan is in this context. Steve Kerrigan was CEO for Obama's inaugural committee. Uh, his counterpart for Trump is Tom Barack, which is, I think, fairly amazing. Barack, but, and it's spelled the same way, too. All right. Uh, what else did he do with it? I don't know. Trump hasn't specified what charities might benefit. But uh, as they note here, some of his past pledges to donate to charity haven't always panned out. Trump's committee has 90 days after inauguration to reveal its donors. There was the million from Boeing, half a million from Chevron, AT&T's in-kind donation, quintupling phone capacity on a national mall. Still not clear exactly what that means. Alex Howard. And this must be how Alex became aware of the AP article. Alex is herein quoted. Deputy Director of the Sunlight Foundation, 
said the Trump inaugural committee is a major vector for corporations and individuals who wish to make donations and have influence on the presidency. He said the big donations and the lack of speedy disclosure set a tone that has implications for the transparency and accountability of the new president. To be sure, the inaugural lineup of balls, parade, reviewing stands, concerts, dinners, bleachers, and the rest doesn't come cheap. John Lipfert, who helped produce the Obama inaugurals, said big outdoor events in winter are particularly expensive, requiring robust sound and video systems, warming tents, fencing, barricades, security screeners, and much more. As for the balls, halls must be rented, stages built, lighting systems constructed, draperies and floral arrangements brought in to dress up the decor. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. There are millions of factors going into it. And don't forget those portable toilets. There were 1,100 along the parade route in 2013. You would have seen them in the news over the last couple of days for whatever reason. Don's John's, the leading renter of portable toilets in the Washington, D.C. area, you see them at all the events, was somebody was covering up with tape, covering up the brand name of the portable toilets, maybe because the president-elect's first name is Donald, and by the way, middle name is John. Yeah, actually true. Don's John's. I don't know whether I don't know whether this was uh, inaugural workers or city workers or Trump workers or who's doing it. I don't know whether Don's John's cares or should care one way or the other about it. Uh, they do care. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm told. Uh, well, from our, our, our house full of production assistants. Where did you see? Did they say something on like WTOP or something? All right. The local radio station is a good source for information. They do care. So are they are they undoing it? Oh, okay. All right. Well, they didn't authorize it, and it's not uh, it's not being undone. That uh, well, you know, how much leverage does the portable toilet guy <laughs> ever have against anybody? Much less against the president elect of the. I mean, it's an essential function. Don't get me wrong. And the guy's probably a millionaire and all that. But uh, yeah, I don't know how what, what kind of fight you pick over that. And particularly, I, honestly, I mean. I guess I've been around here long enough to know it's just it's one of the monop- there are a couple other portable toilet companies you know they do exist but Don's Johns is top of the list for large scale events certainly and and it might not necessarily be something that other people notice as much as I do and now they've probably gotten more publicity out of the fact that there are stories about the name being covered up than they would get otherwise and so Maybe they're, they can afford to look the other way. Anyway, that's not supposed to be the focus of this story. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, while a big share of the cost is covered by the private donations, taxpayers provide a considerable amount as well. They're on the hook, for example, to cover the close to $5 million cost of building the bunting decorated 10,000 square foot platform built on the west front of the Capitol for the swearing in. By the way, Let's all hope the engineering is is good. Does everybody realize that that's something that's constructed anew each time? I don't know if everybody is as familiar with the uh, the architecture of the West Front as uh, people who've spent uh, some time there. But yeah, the, the 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 podium that they're all on is not actually a permanent part of the Capitol building. It looks like one because it's covered in bunting. It's covered in bunting because it's made of scaffolding. And I guess it should strike everybody as troublesome that the entire elected leadership of the country all sits on one, you know, temporary piece of scaffolding at one, at the most important juncture. Um, don't tell any terrorists. I, I won't if you won't, but that's a little bit scary, but I, I think they actually do just like with the state of the union, uh, keep somebody somewhere else. In case of trouble, but really that is a little troubling. Anyway, it's covered with bunting, so you won't see. Well, it looks better on TV, but also you won't see how rickety it really is. And I don't know if everybody would go on it if they knew how rickety it was. But uh, okay, neither is that supposed to be the focus of the story. And yet, uh, it's what we do here. Okay, so um, where were we? Oh, yeah, so it's a 10,000 square foot platform, by the way. That they build. That is, a, that's an awful lot of ricketiness to hold up. Uh, the public also pays security costs for an event that brings together a big chunk of the U.S. political leadership, hundreds of thousands of ordinary Americans, and a fair share of protesters. Because those expenses are scattered throughout the federal budget, it's hard to get a fix on just how much the day will cost. 
Some tabs, these tiny ones here, are spelled out. $1.25 million for the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, which is responsible for the swearing-in ceremony. Inaugural luncheon, you forgot about that part, and review of troops. And $2.5 million for overtime for the U.S. Capitol Police. The inaugural luncheon, by the way, should probably be eliminated. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to an inauguration. I guess if you're watching it on television, it's not quite as excruciating, but you have this big the, sort of, I guess the climactic event would be the swearing in, which is supposed to happen at noon, but then there's the parade part. And if you've gone downtown and you're excited about the new president being sworn in, you you want to see the swearing in, but then you want to kind of see the parade. But the parade doesn't begin right away because the inaugural, the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies arranges it this way. I guess before this, this dates before the time when people cared about being satisfied with the parade immediately necessarily. But you swear the guy in and then you turn around and go inside for lunch, the luncheon. What time is the luncheon? Well, Probably pretty soon after the noon thing, right? They're not going to start the parade until after the luncheon. So everybody's standing outside in the cold waiting to see the new president on parade, but he goes inside and has lunch first, and you stand outside like a schmuck waiting for the parade. Anyway, they should get rid of that because nobody cares, but they're not going to get rid of it because uh, here's an opportunity for insiders in Congress to have a sort of an, I wouldn't call it intimate, but to have a lunch with the new president, you know, in close proximity to power, away from the prying eyes of the filth gathered outside to watch you in your parade. And just sort of an immediate exercise in, in insiderism that doesn't benefit anybody, and I bet the food's not even that good. More than 5,000 active duty service members, by the way, and 7,500 National Guard members will take part, too. That, of course, ringing a bell for some of you because you heard over the weekend that the co the commander of the D.C. National Guard is set to be, well, this has become a more complicated story. The Trump team notified him at 12.01, you're out. I do not know why the president of the United States has control over the, you know, that, that tight control of the D.C. National Guard. I would have thought that that might rest elsewhere. I think we mentioned this on Friday. Anyway, the story evolved over the weekend. Uh, the Trump team became so embarrassed by the bad press of all this, because after all, it is a little bit weird to do this at 1201. It's a little vindictive. The guy hap happens to be African American, although I don't know whether that had anything to do with it. It's surely easy enough to accuse the Trump team of racism, but that didn't really seem to be a huge element of this. I think it was more of it. He's not our guy kind of thing but you don't it seems a little bit less than optimal to dismiss the commander of the security forces responsible for let's say for one thing making sure nobody nefarious says holy mackerel the entire uh political leadership of the united states of america gathers on one temporary platform open air platform uh, at one point on at noon at an appointed time on January 20th, what a great opportunity to score a huge, horrible terrorist strike. Well, you better hope that security is tight and that there are plenty of military forces on hand. And don't fire the commander of those forces at 1201. You know, you're safe up to 1201, but after that, now replacing the commander, I assume that he's a responsible guy and that there are seconds in command who could take over. And once the troops are just deployed, I don't know if it necessarily makes a difference who's at the desk waiting for that terrible phone call that the whole thing fell apart. But uh, it might make some sense to leave the guy in place. And so the terrible backlash did, in fact, move the Trump camp to say, uh, well, depending on who you believe, either there, because the first report was, we didn't ask him to leave. We know this is fake news, but eventually that became an indefensible position. And instead they went with, well, we'll instead reverse our position and say, please stay a couple you know, for the rest of the ceremony and a few days after, and then we'll transition nicely out to, to whoever's supposed to come next. And no word on, I don't think on who that actually is because they don't care. They just want the, Oh, there's a name? Okay. He's a brigadier. There you go. Brigadier. Uh, okay. Well, all right. <laughs> At least he's a brigadier. 
Uh, I'm sure they had, they had to had somebody in mind, because really, honestly, just firing him for zero reason didn't seem to make any particular sense, even for the Trump camp. Anyway, so they've got somebody in mind. That's, that's good. Uh, but they apparently said, uh, all right, you can stay on for a couple of days for continuity's sake. Uh, and, and so the rest of the weekend, the Trump troops were out there saying, ah, fake news. He wasn't asked to leave. He was asked to stay. Uh, but the guy had already made the bulk of his arrangements for his transition out, and he just said, eh, you know, to hell with it. You, you say I should stay longer now, but I got it all set. Plus, we got the new guy coming in. It's, you know, I'm just going to go, uh, which the Trump online teams translated into. Now he refuses. He's leaving. This is all his fault. He's the one that's quitting at 12.01. So, I don't know. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so all of those people are going to be out there. The uh, 7,500 National Guardsmen, 5,000 active duty service members, I, as I understand it from other articles, uh, brought in from around the country. And, and by the way, serving unarmed for whatever reason. I assume that that's uh, kind of uh, one of those weird uh, uh, areas of law in between posse comitatus and... Uh, uh, whatever else might, uh, you know, civilian control of the military and uh, the, this being the military district of Washington, uh, of, the, uh, of Columbia here, military district of the District of Columbia, I guess is how they would refer to it, and that troops from outside, though uh, they're needed for support staff, uh, won't bring their arms because they're not directly under the uh, uh, control for combat purposes of the D.C. National Guard. What You know how these weird things work. Anyway, $21.6 million uh, rolled into the Military Inaugural Joint Task Force and Defense Department budgets for those purposes. The mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, says the city expects to spend at least $30 million with the federal government reimbursing the full amount. So far, Congress has appropriated $19 million, and the city will go back to Congress after the swearing-in to ask for the rest, at which point the Congress will pay. Go F yourselves, more than likely. I don't know whether they'll pay for that or not. They might not, just to see what happens and see if they can spark a fight in some way. Anyway, coming to the close of things here, uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch up on a number of other things during the week, of course, one thing that I definitely have to mention, uh, you will have read it, of course, over at Daily Coast, and I will share the piece you likely read uh, last night about it. Just wanted to note for the record, though, yes, I guess over the weekend, Donald Trump did interview with somebody. I know he was talking to the British press, but uh, here the Washington Post has coverage here that uh, Barb has, Barbara Morrill, as summarized for us, Trump promises all of America will be, quote, beautifully covered under his secret health care plan. So the repeal and replace, the replace part is here. All the details that you need to know to be confident in the replacement are out. You will be covered. It will be beautiful. You're going to love it. You'll have better health care than you ever had before, and it will cost less through some magical mechanism. Barb puts it this way. It's hard to say which will get your eyes rolling more popular vote loser Donald Trump's grandiose promises or the stenographic chops on display in this article from the Washington Post, which begins with President-elect Donald Trump said in a weekend interview that he is nearing completion of a plan to replace President Obama's signature health care law with the goal of, quote, insurance for everybody. Hooray, we got it. So is that going to make your eyes roll more or the inevitable Trump declined to reveal specifics in the telephone interview. The Post does manage to acknowledge that this alleged plan is, quote, likely to face questions from the right and basically everybody in the world, but also includes this remarkable line. Trump did not say how his program overlaps with the comprehensive plan authored by House Republicans. Uh, newsflash, journalists, Barb says, there is no plan, comprehensive or otherwise, authored by House Republicans. Anyway, back to Trump. He promises people won't be dying in the streets unless maybe they live in John Lewis's district. But everyone in America will be covered and not just covered. They'll be covered beautifully. I love it. And how will this happen? He's ready to use the power of the presidency and Twitter to usher his legislation to passage. And there you have it. He's going to tweet it into existence. And we all know that this is possible. 
I don't expect anything less from him. And uh, it's all going to be amazing when it finally happens. There's plenty more, of course, that we'll have to summarize over the coming week, though it is time to hand the reins over just about to our friends on the after show who will doubtless capture everything else that we missed today. Uh, perhaps uh, perhaps they'll dive into the news from over at AP that also notes that uh, Trump's plan to donate foreign hotel profits can't be checked. That's what I told you last week. That's what Joan told you last week. And honestly, you didn't even need us to do the telling. But uh, that piece, I think, grabbed my eye and certainly will grab your attention. We'll discuss it a little bit more in depth later in the week. Let's see. Oh, as a matter of fact, I guess the uh, the summary is here, and I could take a quick look over there. We don't actually need the outro music necessarily in order to begin discussing these things, but uh, I don't know. It Somehow it accompanies things so nicely, but uh, at least I can take a quick look at it. Uh, you know what? As a matter of fact, why don't we just... Uh, oh, you know what? Actually, we won't. We'll wait, because we've got another minute to do here. Uh as I'm thinking about the way these timing things work out. However, I can just eat up that minute just discussing the fact that we have another minute, if that's what you'd prefer to do. And I'm sure it is. Anyway, oh, we've got alarms going off, letting me know that uh, we're almost there time-wise. What else uh, might we do? Well, you know what? Let's let's uh, roll our, our uh, stuff out here. Metaphor Monday on the after show, as they like to call it. I don't always give the title of everything because I usually start this outro much, much later. But this time we'll take it at a leisurely pace. Trump is already forgetting farmers. How can you do that? I mean, they have their own dating service, for God's sake. Anyway, Trump is already forgetting farmers by not nominating anyone for the Department of Agriculture. Have we not noticed this? Have we all forgotten farmers as well? Well, uh, he, uh, he should look at our farmersonly.com, I think would be a great idea. A great place to start looking for a, an How could you not have an agriculture secretary designee at this point? Anyway, Trump press secretary Sean Spicer threatens John Lewis that civil rights will definitely suffer. Wow. If questions about Trump's elections continue. So that's a good thing. All right. John Lewis has questions about the legitimacy of uh, Donald Trump's election. He cares a great deal about civil rights, and so therefore we're not going to have any because the Constitution is nearly as important as taking revenge on people who say mean things about Donald Trump. Wow. That's going to be pretty amazing. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel, which is uh, the pronunciation that Greg put on. Is it Merkel? We always said Merkel, but maybe Merkel sounds, uh, I don't know, sounds more European. Let's go with that. Reminds Trump and Putin, or Putin, if you prefer, that Europe's fate lies in its own hands. For the last half, they'll be reporting that the Trump team considers kicking the opposition party press corps out of the White House. Yes, another big story. Very important. Thank you for covering that one. So as to accomplish, or rather to accommodate, hundreds more reporters from Breitbart, Infowars, Sputnik, and RT. Is that really so? Well, let's wait and find out if that's the case. And nativism is as American as rotten apple pie. Those stories and much, much more coming up after this on The After Show with Wink and Justice. Next. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Thank you as always for listening. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm smelling some uh, second breakfast going on in the background here, so I'm going to go up and join the family for that one. Enjoy your Martin Luther King Day if you have it off from work, and if not, uh, call in sick tomorrow. You both deserve a day off, if you ask me. I'll talk to you tomorrow.